Hey guys, JH Miller01 here, and welcome back to another video. Today is a very extensive video covering one of the most scarcely talked about subjects in bass fishing. As a kid growing up, I always saw, you know, big bass being caught 10, 12, 13, even 15 pound bass. But looking in the record books, I would always see 18, 19, 20 pound bass being caught. But I looked at all the catches, and there was a correlation. Almost every fish over 18 pounds was caught before the early 2000s. And me, naturally, being curious as to why this was the case, did some research. So I compiled some articles for you guys, and I'm going to be going over some of my thoughts and my takes on why we haven't seen 20 pound bass in recent years. So today's video is going to be split into three distinct parts. First, catch and release. Second, bass getting smarter. And third, lake sustainability. So all these three different topics, I believe, have a role in why we haven't seen mega largemouth bass in recent years. So we're going to go ahead and get into it with uh, part one. Now before we dive deep into this topic, catch and release has been something I have lived by since I first picked up a fishing rod when I was four years old. If I'm not going to eat a fish, I throw it back. I'm plain and simple. I very rarely keep bass, and generally I don't keep fish too often, but that could be part of the problem. In this article written by Larry D. Hodge on Texas Parks and Wildlife's page, he brings up very important points that I think should be mentioned and thought about by everybody in the fishing community. Now, this article was published in March of 2006, so this is a somewhat older article, but I feel like it has some very good information. I think the very first sentence in the article says it best, nothing in excess applies to fishing as well as life. Now, this statement can be thought about in multiple ways, but I believe it's plain cut and dry. Overdoing something almost always causes more harm than good. Moderation is key. In the opening paragraph, Larry says catch and release fishing, throwing back every single fish caught, comes near to being a religion among bass anglers, many of whom would consider eating a largemouth bass to be a mortal sin. In my experiences, almost everybody that I have seen keep a largemouth bass has faced some sort of backlash among fellow anglers, whether it be on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Now this is very ironic because catch and release, as this article states, didn't really begin catching on until 1972. George Perry, when he caught his 22 pound largemouth bass, it says here he didn't even consider releasing it. He brought it home and fed his family for a whopping six days. Now what I'm saying here is that catch and release is a relatively new concept. Catch and release was definitely not something that everybody always lived by like we do today. Now the reason that that's important is I feel like that might have a factor in why we aren't seeing 18, 19, 20 pound bass anymore. I'll just let Larry do the talking. He says the trick is in keeping the right fish. Only a very small percentage of the fish in the population survive to the age of five or six and become the trophy everybody dreams of catching. Trophy fish are just naturally scarce, and protecting them from harvest is logical, and research supports catch and release of big fish. Now what he's saying here is you go out and catch a 5 plus pound fish, you should release it, because those are going to be the fish that are going to grow up to be the 10 pounders, the 15 pounders that everybody wants to catch. Now Larry also brings up smaller fish. When you're talking about a 2 pound fish, not all of them will grow to be big. Anglers don't need to feel guilty about eating some of them. Now, the reason why this is important is I've seen it time and time again in local stocked ponds around the area here. Whenever you get a large population of medium to small fish, none of those fish can grow up to be big because they're all fighting for food. All of those fish eat the same forage, and therefore, since there's so many of them, none of them are going to outgrow the other ones and reach trophy size. An example that Larry brings up in this article that I find very interesting is about a lake named Lake Limestone. What he says here is in 36 Creel survey days involving hundreds of anglers, we found that not one single person took a bass home. That means that none of the fishermen that were involved in this survey brought home bass to eat for dinner. Every fish was released, every fish was still in that lake. The article goes on to say fish in Lake Limestone essentially die from natural causes such as old age and being eaten by other fish. From a practical standpoint, those fish that are dying can be harvested and eaten without having any detrimental effect on the population. 
what he's saying here is that those fish could die by natural causes either way, the smaller fish, but they could be much easier utilized by feeding people. And I feel like the final sentence in this article sums up the concept perfectly. Instead of looking at a two pound fish as a future lunker, you may need to think of it as one of the reasons you aren't catching 10 pounders. In this second article written by Deborah Dean, she says here, Studies indicate that long-term catch and release fishing can indeed impact a fishery in a negative manner. Smaller, more aggressive fish deplete the food resources of a take faster and more efficiently than larger fish. According to biologists, these fish actually take more forage for their size than they're worth to the lake in recruitment. And what that means is that those fish eat much more than the larger fish in the lake and aren't essential to the population. From this first part of the video, what I'm trying to get at here is that by overdoing catch and release, by everybody releasing every single fish that they catch, we might be doing more harm than we are good. And the reason I say that is again, I'll look back at the top 50 largemouth for let's say Texas, one of the best bass fishing states in the country, and you start looking at it and almost every single fish in that top 50 list was caught in the 1980s, the 1990s, or the early 2000s. Now you might see a 2010 or a 2013 every once in a while down towards the bottom of the list. Almost every 16, 17, and even the, the state record 18 pound fish was caught in the 80s and 90s. And that was before these lakes became the lakes they are today, filled with many smaller one, two, and three pound bass. These lakes were still relatively new, and so they had less fish. And so these bigger fish, were able to grow to that astronomical size that they did. And that's a perfect segue into part two of the video. Now I did some extensive research before I made this section of the video and I couldn't find very much about it at all. In fact, I only found this one paragraph that really explains this concept the best, but it does have to do with the overall subject of the video. In this article written by David Goldenberg, he says that the role the reservoirs play though remains somewhat mysterious. Lakes go through a natural aging process, says Allen, who explains that trophy fish usually appear relatively soon after lakes have been formed. Perhaps that explains why far fewer giant bass have been caught in Southern California since the early 2000s. And that just plays into this whole theory. What he's saying here, and there isn't very much known about this, so I guess you know, I can't really expound on it like I can other topics, but he says that lakes go through a natural aging process. Now, what I can best interpret that as is that whenever lakes first form, like I mentioned at the very end of the first part of this video, there are far fewer fish in the lake overall far fewer bass forage species there's a lot less overall uh, fish and life in the lake and i believe that that is why we saw those 18 19 and even 20 pound bass uh coming out of california uh in the early 2000s now unlike some outliers like clear lake which has been around for millions of years which is what the estimate is uh, let's say Lake Berryessa. Largemouth bass were not introduced into that lake until the late 1950s. And as you, many of you know, the bass fishing in those lakes really skyrocketed in the 90s and early 2000s. Now why it took 40 years, maybe the population just had to slowly increase to that point, but also why is that lake not producing 17, 18, 19 pounders today? Again, there's not been really many articles at all that can account for this. Now, as some of you may know, Manabu Kurita went fishing in Japan a few years back and he actually ended up catching a 22 pound largemouth bass out of Lake Biwa in Japan. Now, Kurita is quoted as saying this, old days of Lake Biwa fishing, I could catch a lot, but could not get over 10 pounds. Then, around 2001, Japanese authorities started to treat bass less as a trophy fish and more as a foreign organism to exterminate, he said. As her numbers dropped, the size of the bass Kurita caught grew for a time. Since 2010, new extermination strategies, including electrification of spawning fish, has made all sizes of bass harder to find. Now this is interesting because this plays back into part one of the video, where he says, that as soon as the Japanese authorities started treating these fish like an invasive species, so to speak, and they started taking out and ordering people to kill the fish, the population dropped and the size went up, according to Kurita. Now this is interesting for multiple reasons. One, 
the old days of lake bigo fishing as he said he could catch a lot but not over 10 pounds now i know many lakes in the united states especially texas where i feel like getting over 10 pounds is not too hard but how big are the fish in that lake what's the biggest fish swimming in lake fork right now who knows it could be a 20 pounder but nobody really knows and since everybody treats that lake like the trophy lake that it is and release all the fish in hopes of those fish being the next you know state record world record that could be playing into why the fish are not getting to that size or at least why they're not getting caught or found more commonly now after looking at Karita's catch of 22 pounds and five ounces in Japan I just had to look at the top 25 bass ever caught now on this list is very ironic Karita's fish is actually the most recent on this list coming in at July 2nd of 2009 all the other fish on this list were caught from the 1980s all the way through again the early 2000s all these fish are also over 19 pounds so why hasn't a fish over 19 pounds which bear in mind is a giant fish i'm not trying to downplay that at all of all the trophy bass fish lakes in the world you've got lake fork you've got lakes such as el cuchillo and el salto down in mexico uh you've got some places over in africa you got lake biwa in japan why is there not a fish after 2009 on this list it's just very surprising that all of these fish of giant stature were caught from the 1980s to the early 2000s now the third and final part of this video is are bass becoming smarter are they remembering the lures that we're throwing and choosing not to bite them. Maybe is that why a 10, 12, 13 pound bass that was caught, let's say a few years ago, that's now 18 pounds, isn't biting because it knows the lure that it was caught on. Now in this article by Ralph Luz, uh, he talks about Keith Jones, the director of research at the Berkeley Fish Research Center, and what he says is that along with memory research, Jones took a look at whether a fish becomes conditioned to avoid certain lures they might see swimming by over and over. There are certainly trends on the bass tours that would seem to suggest that, Jones said for a study. For example, spinnerbaits, once a dominant presentation for top pros, seem a useless bait today. Which, I wouldn't totally agree with that, I love my spinnerbaits. But anyway, swimbaits, frogs, and other newer trends have replaced the old lures, which is completely true. There's new lures constantly coming out. Now what Jones says here is that the four main methods of learning are associated learning, habitation, spatial, and prey image. Images. He says to think of associated learning as trial and error learning. He also goes on to say that the fact that bass are capable of associative learning is proven by laboratory experiments where the animal is taught to link two types of stimuli, such as a certain colored light with an ensuing electric shock. Jones writes, bass readily learn these associations both in the lab and the field, although not as fast as some other species. So what he's saying here is that bass over time are able to adapt and learn from past experiences. So example, uh, learning that a colored light is associated with an electric shock teaches that bass not to go to that colored light, just like maybe a deep diving crankbait, the bass sees that once, eats it, gets caught and released, sees that same bait again, might not bite it. Now this part of the article is very interesting. Jones even cited a four-year study by the University of Illinois that documented recapture rates of largemouth bass. The average bass was caught twice each season, but some bass were caught up to 16 times in a single season. Now what that means to me is that that fish gets caught more times, it's probably going to start biting less and less, but this is proven in the next part of the article. Jones meticulously tested bass memory for lures, and his study suggests that indeed, bass do remember. In the study, bass were allowed to strike a minnow lure for a 5 minute test period. In the beginning, most strikes came in the first 1-3 to three minutes. By the end of that 5 minute period, the bass had learned to ignore the lure because it provided no positive reward meaning there was no food to be had by striking the lure. The bass were then divided into two groups with no additional testing for different lengths of time. After two weeks, the bass in one group were re-exposed to the same lure again for five minutes. The response of those bass was about one-tenth of what it was in the initial exposure. According to Jones, that indicated the bass had retained a strong memory of the lure during a two-week interval, and it was a negative memory. Since they didn't get food out of it, they remembered that, and when they saw it again, they weren't having it. And it even goes on to say, after two months, the second group of bass still tested below their original response level. 
In quotes, the results show that under some circumstances, bats can remember lures for at least up to three months and perhaps much, much longer. Now this is very, very monumental. If bass can remember lures for up to three months and quote, perhaps even much, much longer, what happens when somebody catches a 10 or 12 pound bass, releases it, what if it doesn't bite again? Now that's quite negative to think that, you know, after being caught once, that fish isn't gonna bite again, but who's to say that that fish wasn't caught two or three times? Maybe when it was five or six pounds, or eight or nine pounds. Who's to say that, that fish isn't gonna bite again, you know? Now this has nothing to do with the first two parts of the video with catch and release and lake health. This is something that can't really be avoided. If you catch a fish, and it's a giant, you catch a fish, right? But that does mean that that fish could end up not biting again. Since more people than ever are fishing in the lakes and rivers of the United States, that could also be playing a factor into why we aren't seeing so many big fish being caught. Since there's so many people out fishing and so many fish being caught, and release, throwback to part one of the video, there's less fish that are gonna bite. So in conclusion to this very uh, long video, I wanna pass off the question to you. What do you think about the lack of giant bass being caught in recent years? And what do you think could be a possible explanation of it? Go ahead and drop a comment down below and like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. I'll be doing more videos like this in the future, but I hope this gave you some insight maybe into why big fish are not as abundant as they used to be. So again, go ahead and drop a comment and I hope you guys enjoyed. And until next time, JH Miller went out. See ya.